one of the first daguerreotype ever taken was a self-portrait. I wonder whether other creatures care about what they look like. You can trace it back to like Plato and Aristotle. This notion that sight is the noblest of the senses. Hello to both of you. I'm Hannah Fry. And I'm Emma Dabbery. And I'm Adam Rutherford. I think we should talk about selfies. We should talk about the science of selfies. So why do we love taking selfies so much? We really do as well. It's worth looking at the numbers and the estimates are up to 93 million selfies taken per day. So it's like an obsession for humanity. I mean, I think at least two million of those are me. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that there's... The, the, the ability to take selfies has sort of unlocked something about our interest in ourselves, our interest in, our, in faces. A lot of brain energy is devoted to faces. And it's almost as if the technology has finally caught up with our evolved psychology. Right, so I, I want to think about the camera, though, because until the camera was first invented, you know, there was no record other than a sketch, right? You didn't have sort of an accurate reflection of it. Well, I think that's not quite true, though, because we can and have been doing self-portraits for much longer than, mm. than cameras existed. I think about Rembrandt, who I think we can all agree is the greatest artist that has ever lived. He did more than 100 mm. selfies and it characterised his whole life. Now, they are selfies. They're much more intricate and aren't not as easy as, uh, as clicking, but it demonstrates the interest in our own faces and our ability to see ourselves as being a preoccupation that predates the camera. The camera itself just turns it, that idea into a, a much easier reality. Before photography, there was a different type of chemical process called daguerreotype. One of the first daguerreotype ever taken was a self-portrait, a guy called Robert Cornelius. He's a chemist from Philadelphia, and he takes a photo using this particular technique of himself. There was something really fascinating about the idea that this new technique emerges, and the first thing that people want to do with it is look at their own faces. Look. It's oh, wow, good, yeah. Yeah. Indeed. He looks kind of grumpy. Sombre he looking. He does look a bit grumpy. Because he had to pose for like 10 minutes. Oh, to... did he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the same reason why all Victorian pictures, they look really, really serious. It's not because they were super serious people. It's because they had to sit still for, for 20 minutes. <laughs> and you can't sort of hold a playful face for exactly. that amount of time. I mean, this is quite different to the situation that we're in now, but I guess the fundamental idea of it is, is the same, that you're, that you're staring at your own image. Yeah, and I think that this is the same for all technologies, that we make it easier to do things that humans are interested in. I wonder whether... Other creatures care about what they look like. Well, th that prioritization, which doesn't occur in, in other animals, a dog's main way of seeing the world is obviously through smell. So, okay, a dog would be <laughs> more likely to be able to smell itself, which I guess as humans we would pro probably find a little bit difficult. Socially awkward. But then there is something a bit strange about the idea that, that other creatures don't know what they look like. Yeah, and I also think the, the conceit that one would only have a sense of their self-identity through that is determined through their image just privileging sight perhaps if we had a sense of self-identity that was determined through a deeper engagement with other senses we'd have different types of self-identity our tendency to make value judgments about things or believe that we can kind of understand some sort of inherent truth about something based on its appearance is just a kind of fundamental like human characteristic. But actually it's something that is very culturally specific, but it actually stems from something called ocular eccentricism, which is the privileging of sight over all of the other senses, because of course we have many, many senses. We can trace it back to like Plato and Aristotle. This notion that sight is the noblest of the senses. Um, the noblest? The noblest of the senses. Fast forward like many centuries, but still in Western philosophy and discourse, when we have the Enlightenment, sight comes to be very much associated with scientific reasoning and rationalization. When I was studying African studies and I guess was first introduced to this idea that there were actually many cultures throughout the world that saw other senses as as important as sight. So didn't have this kind of like inherent belief that you could understand or make a value judgment about something based on its appearance. I mean, that's definitely true of science, right? Like the microscope, the telescope being these big moments where finally, as soon as you can see something, you believe it to be true. 100%. The development of the microscope was absolutely essential to the birth of biology. It was effectively the birth of biology. Um, we do 100% privilege sight over pretty much all the other senses. And that is very different from 
almost every other animal that's ever existed. I think there are some consequences of that that are, la that are not necessarily healthy. And perhaps if we understood ourselves uh, through other senses, all of society would look very different. Are you advocating for sniffing ourselves more as well? <laughs> <laughs> On that point, so there's, there's quite an interesting um, psychology study uh, by Epley and Whitchurch. And uh, what they did is they, they got participants to sit in front of a computer. But then what the researchers did is they sneakily tweaked some of the pictures to make them more conventionally attractive and also slightly uglier. And would you believe it, people recognise the more beautiful photos of themselves much faster than the others. But I think that there's a little hint in there of something, which is that there is perhaps an element of self-deception about the fact that we don't like the idea of what we objectively look yeah. like. But then on the other hand, I sort of think that um, if I think of all of the people who I know and love, it's very rare that a photograph of them will capture how beautiful I think <laughs> that they are. And so maybe I just think, actually... Selfies are sort of a, a poor representation of the reality. So you may as well take the best curated selfies you can possible. <laughs> well, we don't see the world in a two-dimensional way. And we don't, see, we don't see it in a still way. It's a dynamic thing, mm. right? And you move around in time and space and your face is animated. When people say the camera never lies, the opposite is true. Oh, yeah. It lies all the time. Absolutely, it lies all the time. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that then maybe, in a way, the selfie, because you have control over it, because you can decide what angles you're using, what light you're using, you get closest to your internal self-image, right? Like, m closer than you would if somebody else was taking the photo. I take an occasional selfie, and sometimes, like, I'll be doing one, and somebody's, like, very helpfully offers to take the picture for me, and I'm like, no, no. <laughs> like, the control of the selfie <laughs> is what I want. OK, I'm actually going to take a selfie now uh, with my new phone, the Samsung Galaxy Z Flip 6. I'm gonna so love if this. you... OK. Wait, so if I'm taking a photo of you, yeah. right, and I'm like, OK. Oh, my God, that camera's But you so can nice. see it from this side. Well, you can see... You yes, can, I'm... I can I, see. Yes. So then you can be like, just, you know, give yeah, your best this, possible this, poses. This, oh, my God, this, this, this is revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> is that what I look like? Mm, I think you look better in the flesh. Can I have a... Can you do it again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm really into it. I think one of the things about selfies, I think there is something really interesting about the idea that it's the closest to your own self-image. But that idea of playing with whose perspective is the subject of, 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 of a piece of art. Um, there was a point in time where there was a, uh, a real fashion for painting people looking away. So you sort of imagine what that person person inside the canvas is looking at. But then um, there's this painting which takes that one step further. It's called The Reluctant Fiancé. This woman who's about to get married, mm -hmm. right? And she's surrounded by these girls who are, you know, adorning her and kissing her. But the key thing is she doesn't look very happy, right? She doesn't look particularly impressed by what's going on. Mm -hmm. right? She's sort of very reluctant. And then you realise that when you switch the perspective of instead of looking at her, but looking from her view, the person who she is staring at is you yourself. But I do think that there's something about that with, with selfies. You know, you're looking at the person, but you're also looking from that same person's eyes, from that same person's perspective. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think these are not just a cultural phenomenon of the narcissistic, but actually something quite important. I think that's true, and I think that, you know, the example of Rembrandt is a great one. Everyone is Rembrandt now, and we just do it with more pixels. Yeah, we certainly do. Well, we've covered quite a lot today, and I think maybe we should finish on a selfie. Shall we? OK, I'll take it, cos I've got the longest yeah, arms. Okay. Yeah, go on then. How do you do it? You, see, you, you just, just raise your hand. hand. There you go. There you go. That's so cool, the way it just does that. <laughs>